presentations that we ask questions. <laughs> Michael said it all. Well, you know, I've got a standard joke on that one. Um, everything has been said, but it hasn't been said by everybody. Yeah. I've sometimes used that when I've come in at the end. Yes, I, I, that's, it's, yes. Uh, we all have our ways of coping with these things. Yeah. So is it no, 25 minutes? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. It is great to see you all here in, 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 in Tampere at the University of Tampere. Instead of having the president of Finland, our honorary doctor, by the way, or the prime minister of Finland, our alumni, or the mayor of Tampere, our alumni, or the chairperson of the local council, a student of local and regional governance at the University of Tampere, to welcome you. We save time for more interesting stuff, and you have only me. My name is Markus Otarauta. I am the academic organizer of this conference, the person who hangs in the corners, trying to be somewhere else when a group of brilliant, hardworking people is making everything ready for you. And I think everything is ready for you to enjoy the academic program. That is excellent. Thanks to you all, because you are here, you are the program. Uh, I am the regular RSA conference participant, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to University of Tampere and City of Tampere. That should be of interest to you all. This is the birthplace of Finnish heavy industry. Some of it is still here, but what we like to say that Tampere is nowadays also the leading knowledge city, or one of the leading knowledge cities, to be honest, in, in, in Finland. Especially pleased I am to welcome you to the University of Tampere, that is the most social science specialized university in Finland. And we also are the most selective of Finnish universities. I don't tell much about the university if I, you know, I feel very compelled to do it, but I, I won't do it. I just mention one fact. Every year we receive something like 16, 17,000 applications from young people who would like to study at the university, and every year we accept 1,250 new students, meaning that our acceptance ratio is, is 7.5, that is the lowest in Finland, and we are very proud of that. And there is a reason why I said this. During the conference, you will find people in yellow t-shirts. Over there, you can see them. If you have questions, they are prime examples of our students who will help you in any question you have. If they don't know the answer, they will find somebody who knows the answer. Uh, enjoy the conference, enjoy discussions, enjoy the place that is always going through some transformation at the moment, too, unfortunately. And next, I give floor to Professor Andrew Peer, who is the chairman of Regional Studies Association. He is a professor from University of Adelaide, Australia, and I mention this for a re reason, because soon, instead of my Finglish, you will hear Australian English. Please, floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marku. Uh, my task today is relatively simple. Firstly, I'd like to welcome you all to this meeting of the Regional Studies Association and also pass on my thanks on behalf of all of you and the Regional Studies Association to Marku and his team for the excellent job they've done in organising this conference. Thanks also go to Lisa Reynolds and the RSA team for their part in ensuring the success of what promises to be a fantastic meeting of academic minds around a whole series of regional issues. I'd like to thank the University of Tampere for hosting the conference, and I'd also like to thank the City of Tampere for hosting the reception that we can look forward to on Tuesday evening. I understand that it is going to be a rare honour and privilege for those of us lucky to take place. I'd like to just give you a few words on the Regional Studies uh, Regional Studies Association to take away with you. And they're just four points. Firstly, I'd like to remind you about our membership. Our membership continues to grow with the 56% growth 
since 2007. Our early career and student memberships are growing robustly based on the services that the association offers, including funding, career-specific events, mentor publishing assistance through regional insights, and special networking events at our conferences and through the bespoke Facebook site. And I'll draw your attention to the fact that many of those opportunities are available at this conference. Membership is a great benefit for all academics, and I'd encourage you to consider joining at this event. In terms of internationalisations, the Regional Studies Association continues to spread its wings internationally, perhaps reflected best by the fact we have an Australian chair talking at a Finnish conference in Welcome. We now have members in 67 countries, and this has grown rapidly over recent years. We have more than 40 countries represented in this conference alone. Increasingly, we have an internationalised activity base with now a European and a global conference each year. Last year, we had meetings in Delft in the Netherlands and Beijing in China. And this year, we meet in Tampere, Finland and in Los Angeles and in, in, in the USA. And in 2014, we'll meet in both Brazil and Izmir, Turkey. The opportunity to meet with colleagues working on similar issues around the globe should never be underestimated. In terms of funding opportunities, this is one of the great benefits associated with the regional studies associations. The next two rounds of the Early Career Researcher Grants have deadlines on the 31st of May and the 30th of November in 2013, with funding up to 12,500 euros available to successful applicants. There's also research network funding available of 3,500 euros, and currently we have 21 networks running at the moment who can, between them, ran 19 events in 2012. We also have a host of other schemes, including travel awards, event support schemes, conference bursaries, etc. And I strongly encourage you to visit our website or talk to staff members about those opportunities. In terms of publications, we continue to be innovative and we continue to press the boundaries. Territory Politics Governments has just launched its first issue, and you can see copies of that uh, in the foyer outside. We'll have a new open access journal to be launched in late 2013, Regional Studies and Regional Science. And please, I encourage you to examine our website for more information. I'd also encourage you to consider attending the session at 11.30 today in Pinney B, room B4116, on open access publishing, a critical issue that's going to shape the academic lives and the publication strategies of many academics in many parts of the world. So on that note, I once again thank our hosts and I thank you for your attendance and I encourage you to enjoy what I expect will be a fantastic conference. Thank you very much. The first plenary session of this conference will focus on, on European Union regional policy. We are going to take all the three presentations in a row and then we'll have plenty of time for discussions after, after the three presentations. Our first speaker is Michael Parkinson, who is the director of the European Institute of, of Urban Affairs at Liverpool John Moores University in the UK. He has acted as an advisor on, on, on urban affairs to the European Commission, OECD, Eurocities, the Department of Communities and Local Government, the National Audit Office, the House of Commons Select Committees, the core cities, and range of cities in the UK, and also some cities and ministries here in, in Finland that I know personally. Uh, he recently acted as specialist advisor to the, some kind of very fancy name, Selected Committee in the UK. There are so many words, I don't read it. He has generated over eight million pounds in research funds to assess the development of cities, urban policy and regeneration in the UK and Europe. He lectures extensively nationally and internationally, and he is a regular contributor to the media too. He was made commander of the British Empire for services to urban regeneration in 2007. Uh, he led for DG Regio 
of the European Commission, the Espon project, second tier cities in Europe in an age of austerity, why invest beyond the capitals? And this is the project his talk is going to focus on, on, on this morning. I will give you Michael Parkinson, the floor is yours. Gosh, I hadn't realized I was so famous. As they say, if my father uh, was alive and heard you say all those wonderful things, um, he'd have been really very pleased, Marco. If my mother was here, she would actually believe it was true, but that's an entirely different thing. Um, let me come to terms of the technology here, which is not straightforward, I can tell you. My speech is below the table here. Um, it's quarter past nine. I'm going to stop at 20 to 10, wherever I am in this talk, I promise you. Um, okay, first of all, my thanks. Um, my thanks to uh, RSA for the invitation, Sally and the team, and, and Andrew's kind words. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be um, in Finland. I've been to Finland a lot, but only Tampere is only my second time. Um, and in that sense, I'm really very, very glad to be um, sharing a platform with Marcus Sartorato. He's uh, one of the reasons we were able to do such a good report. Um, I think he's a great scholar. I think he's been a great deliverer. He's a great friend, and so I'm delighted to be here with him. Um, what I'm going to talk about, really, in this is some work I've been doing which asks the questions, what's been the, what are the performance, the prospects, and policies for cities across Europe, and in particular, uh, I'm going to talk about the question of what role do capital and non-capital cities play in the European economy, in national economies, uh, and ask the question, in an era of austerity, indeed an era of crisis and recession, where are we going to invest our scarce resources in future at European level and at national level? It's, it's an issue for my friends from the Commission as well as national governments. And pretty obviously, those questions about territorial balance, territorial hierarchy, territorial governance, territorial investment, these are standard, classic, old-fashioned debates we have all the time. But it has been given huge urgency by the crisis which is upon us because with scarce public and private resources, the investment decisions we make in the next decade are going to shape the kind of our territory for two or three decades, and I think there's a risk we're going to abandon investment beyond the capitals. That's my kind of point. I mean, capitals clearly are hugely significant to national economies. They have all the agglomeration advantages. Um, they're often a source of government that centers government decision making. They're wide in the global economies. They have investment opportunities. They have research and uh, facilities. Um, they often attract all the prestige projects, but in a way, non-capital cities can also make a significant contribution to national and therefore, I would argue, European performance. And partly because of the negative externalities of growth, I think there's a huge opportunity to ask the question, where should we be putting our public and private money in the next decade? I have to say urban policymakers across Europe um, seem sort of agnostic on this issue. There's not a great deal of what I'd call explicit debate about these issues, and the default position typically is to continue to invest where we typically invest, which typically means the capital. So there's, uh, that debate, I think, needs to be opened up. If you go to economists and analysts for advice, it's not much better, actually, because you've got basically what economists say depend where they sit. So you get a gang of free market economists who effectively argue about agglomeration economies and therefore talk about let the market determine, in which case the capital will grow. Or you get another set of economists who believe much more in the public sector and intervention, who talk about shaping and steering our kind of national territorial hierarchy uh, by investment decisions. But we have an awful lot of sort of huffing and puffing and not much evidence. And I'm trying to give some evidence. On the whole, um, I've been very taken with the work of the OECD in recent years, who are obviously looking at regions rather than cities. 
And they've been developing a very interesting model which we are sort of applying at a city level, asking the question, where does growth come from? And what they're talking about is the long territorial tail with um, a lot of growth from a small, small number of places at the top and very little growth from a small number of places at the bottom, but a huge amount of growth in the middle. And to some extent, you can argue we haven't had all the growth out of our capitals we can get, but we may be near the maximum. There are places at the tail from which you're going to get not very much growth. But the fact is, most growth in the last 10 or 15 years before the crisis came out of that middle bit of the territorial tail. So I'm kind of interested um, if that works for city regions. Okay. That's my first five minutes. Um, I'm going to ask four questions, really, since um, on the project itself, um, who are we? What, we tr what were we trying to do? Um, how do we do it? But really, the only interesting question you want to know is, you know, not who are they and, and what were they asked to do, but what are the kind of key policy messages for us today? Who are we? I mean, transnational gang, my own institute, colleagues in Budapest, and I just put this up because Marcus Otterota and University of Tampere played a very important part in discussion, advising, and Peter Hall um, and Christian Lefebvre from Paris. What are we trying to do? Answer a set of questions which I think become increasingly compelling, as I say, in the, uh, the next decade, perhaps, of the, the crisis. Get some questions on what economic contribution to capital and second-tier cities make to national and EU performance? Which of those, <clears throat> which of those cities are, quote, punching their weight <clears throat> economically, uh, nationally, and at European level, and how and why? Um, what's been already the territorial impact of the crisis, and what are the implications of the crisis going to be? Um, Who's going to do what better or differently in future? Because after all, that is the key question. Who are the second tiers? We had a lot of discussion of this. Um, I came down to fairly common sense deci decision that the second tier cities in any national economy are those larger non-capital cities whose economic performance is significant to the national economy, either because it's dragging it along or is dragging down. Um, and what we did, and of course, as I'm not a geographer and you lot are, whole questions of boundaries is very, very complicated. But what we've tried to do is work with a agreed set of boundaries and what we've taken as the OECD European Commission agreed metro region boundaries across Europe because that gives us a pretty robust comparable database. Uh, and what we've got in our study, actually what I'm talking about today, is 155 cities um, across Europe, 124 of which are second tier, 31 of which are capital cities. So it's a pretty big database and it contains about 50% of European population and about 75% of the urban population. So it is a pretty large middle. Um, the EU, in a way, and the, and the Commission uh, paid for this work through ESPON um, because obviously it's a big policy issue and particularly in the um, new member states of where should investment go and particularly in the new member states where the capitals do tend to dominate the economies. There, so there is a kind of a big policy issue of do you continue to invest in capitals or do you, do you diversify and spread? And so the commission said, can you get us some evidence about what's the performance of the second tiers? What is the gap between the capital cities and the second tiers? And perhaps most significantly, what is the direction of change? Is that gap staying the same? Is it getting bigger? Or is it being closed in different member states? The second kind of question which they're interested in is obviously, well, is this really a policy debate in the member states? Are these issues actually explicit policy issues or are they in fact implicit policy issues where we just do what we normally do rather than asking the question? The third kind of question I'm asking is, well, actually, in those policy debates, what is the key issue in the last 
10, 20 years, we're going to talk about European Commission policy a lot. Um, is the key issue for urban policy and city policy and regional policy seem to be one of economic competitiveness, or is it one about inclusion uh, or cohesion? Are those issues actually made ex explicit and talked about, or do they just remain implicit? In fact, is there in most member states any great concern for what you might call the territorial impact of investment decisions and mainstream, mo cram, mainstream program decisions. And then the final question, are governments and is the commission doing anything about it? Are they in fact, uh, do they have a, a kind of a national or EU policy for quote second tier cities? Are they targeting those cities? Are they trying to increase the capacity of those cities and regions? And I know my colleague will say more about this. Are they trying to provide more powers and resources for those cities? Are they imposing fewer constraints? So that's, that's the policy context, where, which is why this matters. What I'm trying to do... Um, right, got rid of that. Is test a set of key arguments. Um, what is the evidence, if any, that if we decentralized powers and resources away from the nation state to cities and regions. If we deconcentrate national investment publicly and privately, what will be the relationship between our national economies? And if we deconcentrate and decentralize, will we get higher performing cities and higher performing national economies or not? What's the evidence? Um, secondly, what is the evidence if we get better performing second tier cities that we will get better performing national and European economies? Thirdly, we're asked to have a look at the, the, the issue of what is the relationship between investment in capital and, and non-capital cities anyway? Is it kind of win-win, which it would be if all those first things were true, or is it actually zero-sum? as actually is typically the policy debate in many of those countries, in which the argument is you can't invest everywhere, you have to choose, you have to invest in the capital. Um, we wanted to explore the argument basically that national policies for second tier cities are absolutely crucial because they are the drivers. We wanted to look at the way in which national governments address what I call the drivers of urban success which are innovation, diversity, skills, connectivity, place quality, and strategic government capacity, um, and say, do national governments, and indeed to pose the question, does the European Commission see those as the drivers of success? And if so, does it look at the territorial implications and impacts of those policies, or does it remain place blind, as our friend Barker would say and John will talk about? And I suppose the final question for us, in increasingly global economy, does territorial governments matter, or does it matter even more, not less, in a global economy? Okay, those are the things I'm interested in we may talk about. I can't answer all those questions today, but I'll say something about them. Um, what's the evidence base? We've got a lot of stuff, um, read a lot of stuff, probably stuff that people in this room wrote. Um, on performance policies and prospects. We have a huge database on economic and social performance of this 155 cities, which is robust, comparable, and over a, a reasonably decent time scale. Obviously, I do have to say, all of us know that we're mainly working with data before the crisis, which is a big issue. We're currently updating that data, but one of our big problems in this field is because the data lags, it's kind of hard to track what's happening. So on the whole, one tends to be before the crisis. Um, we did a lot of, frankly, talking to people who make policy at European level, at national policy level, uh, in cities and the private sector, and we did a questionnaire. And then we dug into nine places. Um, what I thought were kind of interesting mixed second tier cities across, right across the piece. Um, we were in Tampere and Cork and Leeds, and I don't have to ring, read them out. So I think we have a really pretty decent mix of evidence. I always believe since the enemy will say anything on the basis of very little evidence, you must try and make the most of the evidence you've got. And I've tried to push the argument as far as the evidence will let me go, and perhaps I've pushed it too far, and perhaps you won't believe me, but I think in a difficult world when we're having real significant 
debates about resources. You have to try and make your case as powerfully as possible. So we've tried to make this case as powerfully as possible. So I'm going to talk about the performance messages first, and then I'm going to talk about the policy messages next. Um, what are the big messages that come out of this? Uh, remember, there is absolutely nothing new under the sun. Any study always says what someone said last time. We're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, but what it does so is, that, you know, across the piece, the performance of city regions, and I, I'm call, I should call them city regions, my metro regions, functional urban regions, city regions, I'm talking here about the functional urban region economies, I'm not talking about the narrow administrative boundaries, so that's what I'm talking about. Uh, and what we're saying, frankly, is their performance is hugely crucial to national economic competitiveness. Where they do well, the nation does well, where they don't, they don't. Secondly, it is absolutely clear that in terms of the baseline, there is a huge gap in most European countries in our 31 ESPON territories between the capital and the second tier cities. And it's pretty clear um, that in virtually every country across Europe, the capital is the dominant economic player in the national economy, but that relationship varies and is changing. It is not homogeneous, it is not standard, and it is not invariable. Um, the fourth point, very obviously, and this is why I cited the issue about East, the new member states, Eastern Europe, capital cities dominate much more in the East and the new member states than they do in the West. There is a particular model there uh, where you do have primate cities. But if that's the kind of the baseline thing, if you look at the performance thing, actually many second tier cities made a growing contribution to national prosperity during the nice decade, the boom decade, from the early 90s to 2000 and 2008. And the argument coming across was that the investment that took place in those boom years, because national economies were booming, actually paid off. And we find in a number of countries, I'll show you, quote, the second tier cities, not the capital cities, were the most successful places in their economy and brought more to the national economy and then we would argue bring more to the European economy. Um, I'm going to show you some figures. I imagine you're not going to be able to see them because you usually can't see them. Um, but what I'm going to say, show you first is something about baseline, something about trend. In terms of the baseline, it's pretty obvious that uh, the capitals dominate, but not everywhere and they dominate differently. I'm going to show you a set of countries, in fact, where actually the capital is not the largest contributor to the national economy. And Germany, the most successful country in Europe still, is not dominated by the capital. There are historical reasons, I know, but it has a series of high-performing second-tier cities. Um, as we go into Austria, Italy, Belgium, and Ireland, or I think the cork measure is a bit strange, you find places where the second-tier cities are better than the capital, and they're way above the national performance. However, they are the exception. In most places beyond those, the capital dominates, sometimes by 5 and 20 percent. Spain, my own country, Netherlands, France, in some countries, it is terribly dominated by the capital, 20, 30%, Denmark, Poland, Sweden, Finland, Portugal. When we get into East, the gap gets very big indeed. You can read it, Hungary, Romania. The capital is 30 to 45% larger. Um, I'm talking GDP per capita, um, standard purchasing power, 2007, incidentally. Uh, and then you get to these uh, newly emerging East European countries, where the capital is pretty much half or two-thirds of the national economy. So remember, some of the most successful countries had more high-performing cities which outbeat their capital. If that's the baseline, I mean, it's a big, a big step up. Um, what's the trend? Uh, we just looked at performance in the nice decade from 97 to 2007. Um, there was very interesting, 2000-2007, uh, looking at GDP per capita and average annual change, we found a set of countries, um, and they tend to be those which are already most decentralized, where 
The second tier cities were actually two and a half times better than the capital, you know, Germany, Italy, France, Norway, Spain, Austria. You know, so there's the example which matches the OECD data of high performing second tier cities. Um, there you had growth, but at slightly lower levels. Uh, and then we're back into the countries, and particularly in the East, where the capitals remain dominant. So the kind of message there is that the parts of Europe which actually did better uh, in the nice decade were those which had, frankly, again, better performing second tier cities. And we saw that in many cases they were better performing than the national capitals. Governance matters in all of this. What I've tried to do, what we tried to do, was ask the question um, about decentralization, deconcentration. We, we measure this in a, in a complicated set of ways, partly about fiscal capacity, but partly just ask the question, where, decision, where does decision-making power lie, nation state, regions, or cities, and, and developed an index. And basically, we group states from the former highly centralized East European to highly centralized unitary, to decentralized unitary, to unitary Nordics here, into regionalized, and then federal, and ask the question, does economic performance bear any relationship to governance? And is there any relationship between centralization, decentralization, deconcentration, and economic performance? And what I'm gonna show you now, it's kind of hard to read, but, but there's a series of the reports outside which try and show the relationship between state systems and economic performance of cities. And what it is, is that. And the low performing cities are on the left hand side as you can see it, and the high performing cities are on the right hand side as you can see it, and it's all 155, and they occupy slightly different positions in their national hierarchy. But I would argue there is a kind of relatively robust relationship there between the performance of cities in less centralized, more regionalized, more federalized countries than in the more centralized countries. Of course, it isn't perfect, but it seems to me that trend says quite a lot. Now, given that's the sort of arguments we were getting constantly from decision makers at European level, not at national level, but typically at regional level and at city level, I think there's something in this argument about where power lies and what kind of economic performance you get. Five minutes, yeah, it's, it's okay. Greater decentralization leads to greater productivity. Is that the same kind of relationship? Greater capital dominance relates to greater National inequality, it shows that. Regional cohesion is greater in countries where the capital did, does not dominate. And regional, sorry, regional, regional exclusion regional is greater where the capital dominates. Regional cohesion is greater when the second tiers dominate. So in my view, we had a decent 10 years. The crisis means there's a risk we're going to undermine the investment we made in all the second tier cities last decade. There's going to be growing competition between public and private investment, which will widen the gaps both within and between capital and second tier cities, or within second tier cities. And we're going to have a kind of race for resources between the capitals and second tier cities. You've seen the, the effect already. Um, that is the impact of unemployment uh, in, the th in the first three years of the crisis. You see the places are being hit. Um, that is the impact on GDP on second tier cities, which basically shows the cities which had a good 10 years from 97 to 2007 have already paid a bigger price than the capitals. Uh, and that's something I did just for the UK audience on what's happened to the second tier cities in the UK, which very clearly shows they did very well in a decade and have already begun to hit. So it's a big deal. So the last bit of this, about four minutes. What's it all mean? Um, there's actually very little policy debate about these issues in most member states. Mostly, however, they concentrate resources on the capitals, not in the second tiers. Mostly they worry about social cohesion 
and issues of deprived neighborhoods than they actually do about a national strategy for urban performance. Um, however, a number of countries are beginning to get the message about the spatial impact on cities of investment policies and the key drivers. Um, and I think the big picture, just to restate the obvious, it seems to me there's a fair amount of evidence that the places which decentralized and deconcentrated did better. What's it mean for the future? And this is about three minutes, Marco, don't worry, I've got my watch in front of me. Um, I would argue for policymakers at national level and my colleagues in the European Commission and to us, um, for, to have successful investment in the age of austerity, the relationship between the capital and second tiers is not zero sum, but win-win, you can grow the cake. There are huge diseconomies of scales of the capital, um, which I suggest means that national government should look to uh, share the wealth in investment. Second tier cities could easily absorb the overspill and the pressure upon capitals. Um, there is very little demand to artificially restrict capital growth. This is not an anti-capital argument, but there is an argument that you want to, in a sense, grow the pie, not kill the golden goose. It's pretty obvious countries vary. Um, the, the number of successful second-tier cities you can have partly depends upon your size. If you're Germany with 86 million, you can have more. If you're Greece with 10 million, you can't have as many. And equally, you, it, would be, it would be naive to say all East European countries should start taking their money out of the capital and putting it in small places. But the argument has to be, in principle, to expand the number of high-performing second-tier cities beyond the capital, that should be the aim. So we need more systematic national and, I would say, commission policies, which focuses upon not simply cities as opposed to regions, but what kinds of cities and what kinds of investment and what kinds of levers are we talking about. And obviously, these are all cliches, we need to maximize the territorial impact of national strategies upon cities in the right way. This is my last slide, my last minute. Um, big picture, I would say, for our discussion about what should EU national policy look like. Um, we do have to make a bigger effort to decentralize responsibilities, real decision-making, uh, and resources. We don't want to decentralize responsibility without resources, and we do want to deconcentrate investment. Secondly, the blindingly obvious thing um, from our study, territorial economic governance at scale is one of the key issues about the economic performance of city regions, and national governments and European Commission should do more to incentivize territorial governance at scale, and I mean city region scale. Thirdly, we're going to have to be much more innovative in the way we find and use money in the future because public resources are at a premium. Four more points, really. Most of these questions don't get... This, this, to me, is a very simple, obvious point to make. But most national governments, there are some exceptions, Poland's an exception, Romania's an exception, where they actually ask the question, where's the money going and does it matter? But on the whole, we do not have transparency about territorial investment. I know it's difficult to get, and John will tell you we want to get it more. Two more points. This is partly a point to our colleague from the Commission. We spend an awful lot of time, effort, and money at a policy level worrying about urban policy initiatives, whether we call it urban, whether we call it this, whether we call it that. There's not much money in that. The key issue for national governments and the Commission is what are the activities and actions and resources and policies of main government departments and frankly, directorates beyond Deja Rejo, what's their contribution to this debate? What impact are they having? And that is debate we need to have furthermore. And then finally, someone said to me, the Commission, when should we invest in second-tier cities? And I said, it's obvious. If the gap between your capital city and second-tier cities is big and it is growing, which it is, if you have a weak infrastructure in your second-tier cities because you've underinvested in those cities or national governments underinvested, uh, you, sh you should look at it. And when the negative externalities of the capital large, you should look at it. So those are at least 
three conditions under which policymakers can say, do we meet those or not? <clears throat> so my argument is there's at least a lot of evidence for us to have that discussion. Thanks a lot. What Michael didn't mention is that, that this report is available in the internet and it's something like 800 pages. If you are not keen on reading 800 pages, there are, let's say, 70 or 80 hard copies of this study available by the registration desk or somewhere outside this auditorium anyway. Uh, our second speaker is John Bachler, who is professor of European policy studies and director of the European Policies Research center in, in Scotland. His research ex experience is principal, principally in regional and industrial development in Europe, encompassing the economic development policies of the EU, 27 member states, and several other European countries. He has also focused on structural and cohesion policies of the European Union, EU integration, and enlargement. He has been an expert advisor to numerous governments government departments across Western, Central, Eastern Europe, and an advisor to European organizations like European Parliament, European Commission, Committee of the Regions, Assembly of European Regions, and he has been an expert advisor to six European Union presidencies over the past decade on budget and regulatory reform. John, floor is yours. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Marku, for that introduction, and thank you to the RSA um, for the invitation um, to this very interesting conference. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back here in Tampere, um, a city in a region which has uh, long and very pleasant uh, associations. Uh, my research center, EPLC, has had a long and constructive relationship, um, particularly with the region. Very pleased to see Yuka Alessentia here um, uh, from the uh, the managing authority. Um, and thank you for, for coming here at this uh, early hour on a Sunday morning. Uh, just before I came up on stage, Sally Hardy said to me, she said, don't be nervous, but um, this session's being filmed and it's being streamed over the web, so everybody will be able to, to hear your speech, your colleagues back home. I said, if you think my colleagues at 7.30 on a Sunday morning in Britain are going to be getting up to watch me, <laughs> you don't know my colleagues very well. <laughs> But anyway, thank you, thank, thank you very much. Um, Michael talked about, um, about some of the challenges for cohesion in Europe. And what I'm going to talk about is the, the policy response to the challenges of cohesion in terms of uh, where cohesion policy uh, is going. Um, partly it's a stock take of the long-term debates that we've heard about at previous conferences in, in, in Delft, in Pitch, in, in, in Leuven and others. And it's also an initial assessment of whether the very high expectations for cohesion policy um, can be realized. Uh, these expectations matter because if we go back just a few years to the budget review that was carried out by the Directorate General for Budget in the, in the Commission, uh, there were quite powerful voices advocating a very different use of the EU budget and a significantly reduced role for cohesion policy. And part of the way the debate has evolved has been to place cohesion policy at the center of the European Union's aspirations going forward. Um, what I'd like to, um, to talk about then is briefly the state of play with the budgetary side of, uh, of, of, of the reform debate. Uh, then talk a bit about the rationale for the reform of the policy uh, and its objectives and focus in particular on three aspects um, which are central, st uh, strategic coherence, thematic concentration and, and better performance. And then to highlight a number of problems relating to implementation which have a uh, 
which, which are important for uh, assessing whether the objectives can be realized. And, uh, and then finally, I'd like to raise some broader questions um, that perhaps are interesting also for, uh, for, future, for future research. Um, just very briefly in terms of positioning where, the, where we are in terms of cohesion policy reform, uh, this has been probably the most open uh, approach to reforming cohesion policy that we've had in its, in its history. It's, it's, it started already after the last reform in 2007, and it went on until the Commission produced its proposals for reform in 2011. We've had a series of negotiations under successive presidencies, and just a couple of months ago, um, we had the European Council coming to an agreement uh, among the member states on the future of the budget, and uh, that's now being uh, deliberated on with the European Parliament with a view to getting some sort of institutional uh, agreement. And in parallel, there are debates on the, the regulatory side, the, 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 the content um, of the policy, um, which, which are also underway. And, they are, and, and it's already starting to become clear how, the, uh, how cohesion policy will look, and member states are responding to that in their preparations um, for the next period. Just in, in, in terms of providing um, some numbers, uh, this is a comparison of the, uh, the budget breakdown from the 2007 to 2013, the current, uh, the current financial framework for the EU, uh, comparing that with the, the Council's um, agreement for the next period. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of argument over two Council meetings, uh, but you can see that the... Uh, the, the much heralded reduction uh, in the overall EU budget is relatively minor in the overall scheme of things, uh, and the budget as a whole is relatively minor um, in the overall um, European economy. You can see also that uh, a major part of the EU budget is still accounted for by the dark blue and the green, um, uh, the, 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 the green policy areas, which are cohesion policy and what's called sustainable growth or agriculture and, and rural development. There have, though, been some shifts in terms of, of, of spending allocations. Um, competitiveness, which is um, Horizon 2020, for example, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, other policies for um, small firm support and so on, has gone up significantly, albeit from a low, uh, a low base. And there have been some reductions um, in the allocations for cohesion policy, um, the, the cap, and then increases for some of the other policy areas. So there has been some, some, some relatively small shift uh, in, in what uh, the EU is proposing to spend its money on. In terms of, of, of cohesion policy, um, what you can see in this um, rather dense slide, um, and you can look at perhaps in, in, in more detail online, is a breakdown of the allocation of spending in the current period in the second and third columns um, between the different categories of, of region. The terminology is now changing. What we called convergence regions in the current period are being called less developed regions, and the com regional competitiveness regions are going to be called more developed regions, and in between we have so-called transition regions. Um, and then uh, what we've got in successive columns are the, what the Commission, uh, European Commission initially proposed and what the Council agreed um, in February. But this is what the Council agreed, the European Parliament um, are still, uh, have still to make their influence um, felt. Essentially though, what you can take from this slide is that in terms of the allocation of, of funding, there is less money going to the poorest countries and regions uh, than was the case in the current period, and more is going to the, the richer parts of, of, of the EU and those, um, those somewhere in between. Um, it's still unclear what that will mean for individual countries, but here is an, um, here is a, uh, an estimate um, which we've produced, um, which shows the percentage change uh, in allocations for cohesion policy for individual countries. What you can perhaps take from that is that if you look down the bottom of, of the slide, you can see that countries um, like Spain and Greece 
are losing something like 25%, or that's the projection of, uh, of their allocations. Whereas countries like uh, France, Italy, uh, the UK, uh, Sweden, may be even gaining uh, small amounts, or at least the, the losses will be relatively um, marginal, which doesn't square uh, particularly well with the challenges that we know uh, that are being faced in different parts of the EU, but reflects the very complex um, financial allocation methodology that is used, which in turn reflects the politics um, of, of the budget debate. Okay, those are just a few, a a few words on, the, on, on, on where we are in terms of the money. Um, what's also significant, of course, is what's going to be done with that, that money going forward. Um, and going back to, to what I said right at the start, the context for this debate is that cohesion policy has been under a lot of pressure because a lot of the research tells us that um, either that the effect of cohesion policy is not, uh, is not particularly good or that it's very difficult to tell. Um, there, are may, there are many regional case studies of where uh, you can see uh, or you can identify what cohesion policy has done, but at European level, um, it's become, it, it, is, it is very difficult uh, to conclusively uh, assess the effectiveness or the efficiency of, of cohesion policy. And that's placed those advocating a continued strong engagement of the European Union to address economic and social cohesion in a difficult position. And so what the the, the tactical choice that the European Commission made was to argue that cohesion policy, because of the nature of the, the multi-level governance system, is actually an excellent uh, delivery vehicle, in, 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 uh, in, as the way it was put, for implementing broader European objectives, certainly those expressed in the uh, uh, Europe 2020 strategy, uh, which sets out targets for the European Union in terms of um, increased uh, investment in R&D, uh, increasing uh, the employment rate, uh, reducing green greenhouse gases, and, 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 and so on. So the argument put forward by those pressing for continued strong cohesion policy as part of the European budget was that, firstly, cohesion policy could deliver on, on overall EU objectives, and secondly, that there was scope for significantly improving its performance, or uh, in, the, in, in the language of you of communiques, the quality of, of spending. And this is where the objectives to improve the strategic coherence, concentration, and performance of interventions um, originate. What I'd like to do is just say a few, a few words on these, uh, these rationales uh, and, and objectives, uh, where they came from and how uh, the challenges or the problems are meant to be uh, addressed. Let's start with strategic coherence um, and, and, and try and explain what that actually means. The problems here originate primarily from, from practice, from the experience of implementing the structural and, and cohesion funds. The problems are that you've got these different funding instruments the European Regional Development Fund, the European Social Fund, the Rural Development Fund, and the Cohesion Fund, and so on. You've got these different funding instruments. They each have different objectives. They each have different rules, different procedures. So first of all, you've got a, a, a mix of, of, of different funding instruments. Secondly, um, there's the, been the problem that member states have not been particularly good at delivering on what the funding is meant to be used for. You have... Um, a long debate at the start, uh, goals and objectives which are set, but then in the process of translating those into member state plans and programs on the ground, um, essentially national priorities or regional priorities take over. Um, uh, and there's a, an insufficient linkage between uh, development needs and challenges on the ground and, and overall European uh, uh, um, uh, uh, objectives. And thirdly, um, these different funding instruments have been implemented in, 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 in very different ways, often in, in sort of silos uh, between so different government ministries, different government agencies have been doing essentially um, their, their own thing. So the, the solution to this was to have a common strategic framework, or is to have a common strategic framework for all of the, the funding instruments, and that there would be partnership contracts, that the member states would make contracts with the European Commission 
um, that would provide the Commission with greater leverage over what member states are doing, and that there would be more integration of, of institutional arrangements, that there would be more coherence and coordination. Um, where we are now is that this uh, framework um, has, been, has been agreed, and the Commission has translated it into so-called position papers, where it's done an analysis of each country's development challenges and, uh, uh, and proposed what priorities each member state should spend the money on. However, in the negotiations, what was initially called partnership contracts have become partnership agreements, which are, le which are, are less binding straight away from the terminology, but also less binding in terms of what member states are prepared to, um, to sign up to. Uh, we, uh, it's still unclear how effective those, those agreements are going to be. On the other hand, um, what does seem to be clear from looking around what member states are doing is that uh, there is a, a serious effort, at least in some countries, to try and find ways of bringing all these different funding instruments together under, um, in, a more, uh, in, in, in frameworks or uh, other institutional arrangements that, um, that will make a more strategic approach possible. And I've, I've listed um, some ways that uh, different member states are trying to do that uh, on screen. So the, the first set of issues relate to uh, the, the institutional management, if you like, um, of the funding to try and, uh, and make it more coherent. A second set of issues, they are associated with the politics rather than um, the practice, although they, they, they touch on practice as well. And these, uh, uh, and, and the politics, um, of the debate um, have brought to light the lack of coherence that cohesion policy has had with overall EU objectives. In the current period, there's been an effort to um, focus spending more on what um, was called the Lisbon Agenda, uh, not always with great, uh, great success. Um, and there's been a general problem of um, the dispersal of funding over a large number of priorities um, within member states, um, often too small to make a, a, a significant difference um, to, uh, uh, in, in terms of achieving overall objectives. So the proposed solution here is to maximize what cohesion policy can contribute to these goals of Europe 2020 that I was just talking about um, by having 11 thematic priorities on which all of the funding would be concentrated and even more so that most of the funding would be concentrated on just a handful of these priorities. Initially, the Commission proposed that 80% of funding in the more developed regions should be concentrated on research and innovation, on small firm competitiveness, uh, and on the low carbon economy. In the negotiations, that's been, that's been weakened, uh, but the, the principle of concentration um, applies. Uh, and in its position papers, in, in what the Commission has been sending out to member states, um, it has been recommending how different countries should spend the money. What you can see down on the, on the, on the left-hand side of the screen are these 11 thematic priorities. The first um, seven of those uh, relate to the European Regional Development Fund, uh, the next few to the European Social Fund, and the last one, institutional capacity, which we'll, which we'll be coming on to. You can see in the countries like Austria, Denmark, and the United Kingdom, the Commission is recommending um, that only uh, seven of those priorities um, should feature uh, in the plans for spending in the next period and successively more um, as the development needs of countries um, multiply. What we can see from what member states are, are, are planning to do is that there's likely to be a shift in 2014 to 2020 uh, to focus much more on, on energy-related themes, on research, uh, technological development, uh, information communication technologies, education, uh, social inclusion and health, and a shift away from spending on, on the more sort of hard infrastructure. The third of the issues um, that uh, the, the Commission uh, that, uh, or the EU as a whole is wanting to address is, is better performance. And this is perhaps the most fundamental of the issues for the future of, of cohesion policy. And a lot of this, the problems that have been identified here emerge from the research and evaluation that's been conducted over the last decade. What we, can, what we, what we know from, from, from research, from the research evidence, 
is that the kind of objectives that have been set for structural and cohesion fund spending have often been unrealistic or unjustified. We've got weaknesses in the policy context. Um, in other words, member states are, uh, or managing authorities, regions are spending money, but without a, a policy environment that is receptive and supportive of that, uh, uh, of, of that spending. There are a lack of incentives to encourage performance. And we don't know um, a great deal about what is actually happening on the ground because the monitoring data is so poor. So the answer to that is um, an expectation or an insistence um, from the Commission side that when countries and regions are developing their objectives, they develop them not in terms of aspirations to increase GDP or increase, um, increase employment uh, in, in individual regions or countries, but that they are framed with specific reference to, re to the results. Um, you might think that's self-evident, but it, it's, it certainly hasn't been um, in terms of, of past programming. And uh, an, a so-called intervention logic has been set out um, which uh, managing authorities uh, are meant to follow. Secondly, uh, so-called conditionalities um, are, um, uh, are, are being introduced. Essentially what that means is that uh, countries are expected and regions are expected to have certain strategic building blocks or policy building blocks in place uh, if they're going to be able to spend money uh, in particular areas. For instance, a lot of emphasis is being put on smart specialization at the core of, of strategies and, uh, uh, in the next uh, period. And there is a, a session, I think, specifically devoted to that at this conference. What, uh, in order to be able to go forward, uh, countries and regions are expected to have a smart specialization strategy uh, to, uh, to be able to, 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 to spend money. A performance reserve is also being debated, something that has been tried not with um, terribly, uh, with, with a great deal of success, where essentially some part of the funding is kept back uh, and given to programs that uh, perform the best. I, I think probably only only Italy has, has really tried hard to make that, um, that work in the past. And lastly, there is an expectation of far better information to be able to justify what cohesion policy is doing through, different, uh, through better reporting, monitoring, uh, and evaluation. Um, again, what we can see from what member states are doing is that there is a, a serious effort underway, at least in some countries, to try and improve the way in which program objectives are framed. Uh, they're trying to uh, identify fewer and better monitoring indicators, ensure better data, uh, particularly so that one can look across, uh, uh, across programs. But if anybody here is involved in the evaluation network that DG Radio is running at the moment or had a look at some of the outputs, you'll be aware of what a, a mountain there is to climb there. More importantly, I think there is still a, there is a big gap between what the Commission has been saying um, in terms of its expectations and for the next period um, and um, what, is, what, what, what member states are actually able or, or prepared to do. So there are, there, there are some potentially um, serious issues there. Okay. Um, lastly, what I'd like to do is, is just to... Um, looking forward at, at, the, uh, at the implementation of cohesion policy in the next period to raise a few questions about difficulties um, that um, are, are, are likely to be um, in, encountered. I think the most fundamental task in any policy is actually the, the, that, that involves funding is actually to spend, um, spend the money in support of the policy objectives. And here... Um, we, there are some, there are some, some, some real, real problems. Uh, if we look at the current progress, the progress of the current programs, um, the levels of commitment and certainly um, the levels of spending, um, in other words, the difference between what money being awarded to projects and, and, and activities and money actually being, being spent under those projects and activities, that those are, are relatively low certainly seriously low in the case of spending at uh, this stage in the program cycle. And, and, the, and the, the reasons are not hard to fathom. There have uh, been big cuts in, 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 in public expenditure, 
uh, in, uh, in many European countries and serious constraints on private sector uh, investment in support of, uh, of, uh, of public develop regional development uh, objectives. And there is a wider issue of the complex, increasing complexity of, um, of cohesion policy putting off applicants from actually applying um, for funding. If we look at where we, uh, at, uh, where we are some months ago in terms of um, the absorption of funding in the current period, what you can see, um, looking at the bar in red, is that under 50% of the funding has actually been spent um, in this period. And those figures go down to um, under 25% um, at the far end of the scale in Romania, but there are also clearly difficulties in countries like Italy um, and, and, and Bulgaria. And if you break that down by funds, um, the situation is still worse for um, some spending of, 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 of ERDF. Now, clearly, we are, um, they, these have been crisis years, um, yet the prognosis for the uh, for the European economy um, are, are not great. So the so the, uh, uh, first question is, will the Commission, uh, will um, member states be able to, to spend the money, especially with a big overhang of funding from um, this period um, going into the next? A second question is capacity, administrative capacity. And I'll not say too much about this because, because Pascal is focusing on this uh, heavily in the next presentation. A lot of the research and evaluation evidence tells us that at the heart of the problems that we've had with the performance of cohesion policy um, is insufficient administrative capacity of, of, of different kinds. That relates to the legality of spending, in other words, being able to spend the money in line with European Union rules. Um, we've seen a whole variety of, of programs suspended or stopped in this current period. Uh, some of the most serious issues are in, in Southeast Europe, but not exclusively. We've seen uh, suspensions of funding in, in, uh, in the UK uh, and other uh, more developed countries as well in recent years. And the, those relate to problems with being able to comply with, it, with, with the rules on public procurement, state aids, and so on. But there's also capacity issues at the, at the root of the, the difficulties um, in ensuring the, what the, the quality of spending, to use the terminology that's used um, at, at, at EU level. And that's related to uh, factors like instability, constant sort of change, organizational um, reforms, changes, turnover of staff. It's related to the politicization of project selection, verging on corruption um, in, in, in some cases, choosing projects according to political pressure rather than um, the, 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 the best projects or those that have the best strategic fit. It also stems from lack of specialist expertise, particularly in terms of implementing what are called financial instruments, sort of early stage risk capital and other, uh, other forms of, uh, of, of funding for, uh, for new and high growth firms uh, and in areas like, like innovation. And also weaknesses of, of monitoring systems and the ability to actually record uh, uh, and assess what is being done with, with the funding. And to a significant extent, those are part of a wider set of problems um, in terms of the quality of government and governance um, in, in, in a number of countries, which we can see from, um, uh, from the work done by Transparency International and, 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 and other bodies. And lastly, I think there are issues concerning the ability of the EU to control what is actually being done with, 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 with the funding. Under this multi-level governance system or shared management in EU speak uh, between the European level and the, uh, and the member states in terms of the implementation of funding, the member states have been very reluctant to give the Commission sufficient powers to enforce improvements uh, uh, in, 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 in performance. And so we've seen systematically Commission putting forward quite strong proposals. Those have been weakened in negotiations with uneven um, compliance. And we can see that with a whole variety of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of examples. Um, so better performance uh, in the next period will, will very much depend on whether the member states are actually committed to the goals uh, that, that, that they've signed up to. Um, in the, uh, the council negotiations, 
The European Parliament will have a bigger role. Will they be prepared to exercise that, their, their, their influence in terms of providing oversight, not just on the money uh, through the Budget Committee, but also on the outcomes and the results through the Regional Development Committee? And will there be transparent reporting? Um, will there be, will the Council, I mean the Council don't have uh, a committee specifically for assessing what is being done with the second largest area of the EU budget. They don't have a specific council committee for uh, cohesion policy to, uh, to have provide a regular assessment of, of what is done with the policy. So there are a whole series of implementation um, questions. Finally, let me flag up a number of wider questions that are potentially interesting to consider for the longer term future of cohesion policy and, and, and also in terms of thinking about, about research. Um, although we're not even, we haven't even finalized the framework for the policy in 2014, 2020, some people within the commission within DG Regio will shortly be starting to think about what the, how the policy might look after 2020. And it's over this next three or four years that there is the opportunity to actually think more fundamentally about where the policy should go. The first question I'd flag up is whether cohesion policy has lost sight of its cohesion purpose. Um, Michael made very clear what the cohesion policy challenge is um, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 the challenges of, uh, of, of, of inequality. Yet what we're seeing in the framework that's being put in place for the next period is a a shift away from the, if you like, the traditional focus of cohesion policy. It's got uh, a much more thematic or sectoral focus, and, there's, and that's associated with a certain loss of, of territoriality. There are certain elements um, of, of, uh, to promote a territorial dimension in the, the regulatory framework, but they're, almost, they're relatively minor. And it's, it's almost as if they've been added in um, uh, at, at the last minute. So this shift to make cohesion policy the delivery vehicle for these wider sectoral and thematic objectives that uh, the EU has is loss, as associated with a certain loss of, of, of regional or, ter or territorial focus. A second issue is concerns the implementation architecture and whether uh, the, the structure that we have in terms of the multi-level governance model is, 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 is too complex to actually achieve um, better performance. Is there, uh, is there a way in which the reallocation of competences um, under the shared management system um, could lead to better outcomes? And lastly, perhaps a heretical question um, for, for those in DG Regio is whether the policy has too much money to be spent, to be spent effectively. Uh, one of the trends that we've seen um, over the last decade is that the role of DG Regio has become much more one of expenditure management. Um, that is potentially starting to shift, particularly through uh, the kind of initiatives that, that Pascal is, is, is leading. Um, nevertheless, with the resources that there are in, in, in Brussels, with the resources that there are dedicated to the management of the policy within member states, the question is whether less money could actually be combined with efforts to improve administrative capacity would actually uh, lead to better outcomes. Thank you very much indeed. This is interesting. I have read in the newspapers that there is lack of money in Europe, and then we can spend the one we have. Another piece of information that stuck in my mind is that Finland is losing money, Sweden is gaining it, and that is what we call Nordic solidarity. We are always willing to help the weak ones. Uh, our third speaker in this session is, is Pascal Poimans, who has studied economic geography at the Faculty of Spatial Sciences in, in Utrecht. Before joining the European Commission in 1995, he worked for an Euro Info Center for small and medium-sized enterprises in Amsterdam, and several years 
for the regional development agency in Arnhem, Nijmegen. Throughout his career in the European Commission, Pascal has been working for regional and urban policy at several country desks for the Netherlands, Austria, Germany, Estonia, Latvia, Czech Republic, and Poland. He was also involved in the accession negotiations for Latvia and, and Czech Republic. And since the beginning of March, he holds the position of head of unit four for Brand new, brand new unit competence center, administrative capacity building and solidarity fund. And if I understand correctly, he will be charged of solving all the problems that were presented in previous presentations. So we are really looking forward for the sake of Europe, your presentation. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, and thank you for, for yeah, increasing the pressure on me and to solve all the problems related to administrative capacity. Uh, thank you also to RSA to invite me for this conference and to give me the opportunity to explain this new unit, what is the background of this new unit and uh, what is the reasoning behind uh, why the Commission established this new unit. Um, well, the title of my presentation is The Secrets uh, of a Successful Administration for Cohesion Policy. Well, will I be able to reveal all those secrets and will I come up with the perfect solution? No. Uh, unfortunately, also from the side of the Commission, we're also looking for the best solution, how to manage uh, structural funds in the next program period, but we certainly also do not have the, the clear-cut answer to all the questions. Um, and in the first part of my presentation, I would like to explain a bit more the approach, the approach from which, uh, from the side of the Commission, we uh, address uh, administrative capacity problems and why this new unit was established. And in the second part of my presentation, I would just like to present you concretely what are the actions of our new unit. Well, just uh, linking to the presentation of John, uh, well, the major concern of our commissioner, Commissioner Hanf, who is responsible for regional and urban policy, he observes and we observe a wide divergence in, uh, within, between the member states, first of all, on the absorption capacity of, uh, of the member states, uh, to what extent they have been able to absorb until now the funds, and also in the effectiveness and the efficiency of the management of the funds. Of course, we work in the context of shared management, which means that member states are directly responsible for the implementation and management of their programs. But nevertheless, the Commission has the overall responsibility for uh, cohesion policy. And that's why we try to look within this delicate balance. We would like to see to what extent we can uh, support, let's say, underperforming member states and regions in managing the funds. The next slide, actually, that's a slide, uh, it's a different slide, but it's almost the same slide as John just presented. This is the most updated data on the, the absorption of the, um, of the European Regional Development Fund, the European Social Fund, and the, the Cohesion Fund. And where you can see, indeed, the same pattern as, as John just showed. On the right-hand side, the countries which are best performing until now, it's Ireland, with almost 67% of the, the allocation has already been paid by us to, to, to the Irish authorities followed by Portugal, Lithuania, Estonia, and Sweden. It's the same top five, but in a different ranking as John just presented. And at the bottom, we see the Czech Republic, Malta, Italy, Bulgaria, uh, Bulgaria and at the last place, Romania, where only until now 25% of the budget to which the country is entitled has been paid to Romania. Uh, and this in the context that we still have a bit more than two and a half years to, 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 to reimburse expenditure. And the end date for, for this program period for payments is the end of 2015. So Ireland almost has spent already more than, almost three times more than, than Romania uh, until now in the, uh, in the current uh, framework. Well, the important factors, which are the important factors which are influencing the absorption capacity, but also the efficiency and effectiveness, because it's not only about spending the money. Uh, it might have been, uh, gives the impression that the Commission is very much focused on this, but we also, of course, are very much interested in the effectiveness and the efficiency of the spending. Uh, I could not include the data, for example, on uh, efficiency of spending on the error rates, which our auditors find, because this is confidential information, but this is, of course, also information we clearly look at. Well, important factors which influence is, first of all, of course, the macroeconomic conditions, which can be defined as the, the, the measured in terms of the GDP. Uh, but here it's interesting to see that countries which are currently most hit by the economic crisis, like Portugal, 
like Greece and Spain, they do not end up in the bottom of the, of the slide I just showed before. Uh, Portugal is even on the second place in absorbing uh, the money. The second important element is to what extent member states will be able to, to co-finance, to, to bring in national co-financing for, for the projects. And this is, of course, also strongly related to, 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 to the austerity and uh, economic crisis to which member states are confronted. And a third, a third important factor is administrative capacity. And that's why uh, Commissioner Hahn and the Commission uh, uh, has decided to pay more attention to, to administrative capacity because we can clearly see that it's one of the main blocking factors for performance of some countries and regions in cohesion policy. If we look at administrative capacity, how it can be defined, when you look at the policy life cycle of cohesion policy, there are actually four five, or five main steps which can be identified. And in a way, you can apply these five steps also grosso modo to any other policy field, but these are clearly now for, for cohesion policy. First of all, it's the general management of the programs, the basic structure, how you set up the, the organization of the programs, the number of operational programs, uh, the main bodies which are responsible for the coordination at national level and at regional level. Secondly, it's the programming. To what extent you are able to define strategies, to formulate strategies, to integrate them into one coherent document, and also, last but not least, to implement these strategies. That's what it's all about. And that should lead to phase three is implementation. The core business of our work is the, the, the setup of calls for proposals, defining appropriate selection criteria, selecting the best quality projects and implement those projects within a not too complex system. A fourth uh, important uh, element of cohesion policy is the whole aspect related to evaluation and monitoring. Monitoring which should be done by the by the authorities, the bodies which are involved in the implementation of the program. Are we on track? Are we meeting our objectives? Are, we, uh, are our programs effective? And secondly, the evaluation, which of course always should be done by an independent evaluator who is not involved in the management of the program. And where the uh, most important thing is not only doing the evaluations, but also following up on the recommendations of those evaluations. And fifth, the financial management and control. Here the basic rules are to pay on time, uh, to have simplified payment procedures without, uh, too with, without too many irregularities which could lead to financial corrections. So these four or five, five uh, crucial elements of uh, cohesion policy can be grouped if, if you want to look how you want to design each step of, of, uh, of this policy life cycle. There are three important factors, dimensions, which should be taken into account for each step. So first of all, it's the, the structure. Again, how do you set up the basic architecture? How do you plan? Uh, which are the key elements? How do you define responsibilities? And which are the key bodies involved in, in each step? Uh, that's the basic architecture. But of course, at the end of the day, the work has to be done by people. So you need to have the right people in place at the right moment and uh, with the right background. And third important element is systems and tools. Um, you have to set up a kind of organization where people can work together via, via the right guidance, manuals, uh, for example, information systems, so that uh, the, 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 the systems can become more efficient. And if you group these two aspects, the five steps of the policy life cycle and the three dimensions, how to design each step in the policy life cycle, you can come to this assessment grid for measuring administrative capacity for cohesion policy. This is one model. When you read the literature, there are other models which are coming back, but they very often are based on the same basic, uh, basic aspects. And this is actually also a tool which we would like to use in our new unit for administrative capacity building, how to measure administrative capacity in each of the member states and individual regions. So, and it's important to take for each step these three interrelated factors into account, structure, human resources, systems and tools, and they, at the end of the day, define the functioning. So maybe a few more words about these three dimensions uh, of structure, human resources, systems and tools. Uh, structure, I already mentioned, it's first of all the basic architecture, the skeleton of uh, how you build up the, the, the management of the programs. And it starts with very simple things, the number of operational programs. Uh, when we look at the, the, the overview and also of the plans now for the next program period, we see that the, 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 the largest number of the operational programs we see mainly in the, in the older member states, not so much in the new member states. 
by far leading the largest number of operational problems we find in Italy, in Spain, and in France, and not so much in the major recipients in the, in the group of new member states. An important other aspect is this clear assignment of responsibilities and tasks to the key institutions involved in, these, uh, in this organization. So the key bodies are the managing authorities, which are responsible for the management of the program, but they can subdelegate tasks to intermediate bodies. And I think this is also a crucial, crucial uh, organization or element in the whole setup. Intermediate bodies are the organizations which are responsible for the daily management, organization for calls for proposals for specific sectors, uh, informing beneficiaries, setting up information campaigns. So I think they are a very important linking pin to, to, to beneficiaries and the overall management of the program. And again, here we can see a clear, uh, an, another clear picture. For example, by far the largest number of intermediate bodies we find in Spain. And again, not so much in, in, in the new member states. Very complex organizations are set up in some member states where further streamlining is possible. The level of subdelegation and degree of complexity. So on the top we have the managing authority, which can subdelegate tasks to intermediate bodies, and in many countries is even going further down to intermediate bodies of the second and sometimes even of the third degree. You can already understand this, this can create a lot of complexities if you do not define upfront clearly who is responsible for what in each step. Um, Again, giving an example, in Greece we have regional operational programs, so where the regional authorities are responsible for the management of, their, their, of the program for their region, but where a part of the subdelegation of the task is going to national ministries. So you can ex understand it creates complexities that the region is not really finally responsible for selecting the projects if it's partly depending on what a national ministry says as an intermediate body. Um, Finally, an important element also is here the, the role of supervision and ancillary bodies like a monitoring committee which has to monitor the whole progress where all the relevant uh, authorities, stakeholders and also non-governmental organizations should participate. Auditors, of course, will have to check at national level if everything is implemented correctly and also in general the partnership with uh, stakeholders and NGOs. And all this should lead to, to at the end of the day, to a government effectiveness, where you can measure the effectiveness of the government. And once again, we, we of course, we look at the absorption of the budget, but also we would like to see that the money is spent effectively and efficiently. And this is just an overview of the government effectiveness indicators you might know from the World Bank, and where uh, you can see uh, which are the leading countries, uh, the Scandinavian countries, Finland, Denmark, Sweden, and then the Netherlands and Luxembourg, and at the bottom are Poland, Greece, Italy, Bulgaria, and Romania. And again, which for us as administrative capacity center is an important indicator to take into account for on which countries and member states we should focus. Human resources, I think that's relatively straightforward and easy to understand. You need to have the right people in place at the right moment and also with the right background. So first of all, you should be able as an organization to assess upfront uh, at what time you need how many people and in which organizations. So there needs to be a kind of a strategy behind how to allocate staff to the different organizations. And also how to recruit, a recruitment policy, setting up transparent recruitment procedures is crucial in this respect. Um, and of course the ultimate objective of this human resources policy is not only that you are able to attract the right people, but also to keep the, the people in the organization. Especially in new member states, we still see a problem with high staff turnover, where people are uh, recruited directly from the university, they gain working experience, and after one or two years, they leave again the organization to the private sector from, with more uh, attractive uh, labor conditions. And that, of course, has a negative impact on the building up of the know-how in the organization. And again, another indicator which gives a bit of a uh, flavor of uh, to what extent strategic human resources management is being used in different countries. These data are based uh, on data from the OECD and where in this slide you can see that uh, the UK, Belgium and Portugal are leading and uh, Slovakia, Greece and Hungary uh, are still lagging behind in implementing human resources management in a strategic way. The third element, systems and tools. Those are the whole set of documents, guidance, manuals, uh, monitoring systems, etc. All job aids which can help to ensure the effectiveness of the functioning of the system. And here actually the key thing is that this, these job aids should help to transfer, 
let's say, the internal knowledge uh, which is available, let's say, in the heads of the, of the people working in the organization to externalize this and to, in a structured way, uh, and transform this into explicit, uh, explicit knowledge. Uh, and in this way, these systems and tools should make the organizations less vulnerable for, for example, high staff turnover, so that when people leave, at least the knowledge is kept within the organization. Just one, again, just one indicator you can look for is, of course, that we are trying to see to what extent uh, information can be more, become more and more available via the Internet and via, via information systems. And here is an indicator to see to what extent e-government is being used by citizens uh, and where, to, to where you can see to what extent, let's say, information from the administration is made available via Internet. And here we can see that, uh, again, the Scandinavian countries are leading and at the bottom are uh, Romania, Italy, and Bulgaria. Data coming from Eurostat. Now I would like to move to the second part of my presentation and just to present to you what we are, who we are, and what we are going to do as a competence center for administrative capacity. As was said in the introduction, we are a new unit. Uh, we only exist since, uh, since the beginning of this year. And our focus is to support especially those countries and members uh, and regions which are now lagging behind not only in absorption, but also in effectiveness and efficiency of spending. So our two targets are, first of all, key criteria is to see to, to what extent we can help to accelerate the, the, the absorption of the funds, but also to improve the quality of the spending. And that's our mission statement. <clears throat> the scope of our work, the scope of our work is that we focus on administrative capacity, but linked clearly to the management of the funds. So it's not about administrative reform in a wider sense, but clearly focusing on cohesion policy. Geographically, our focus is in those countries and regions, as I already mentioned, which have the weaker administrative capacity. But horizontally, we also focus on those policies and bodies, organizations, which have an important impact on the effectiveness of our policy. And here, public procurement is, I would say, probably the most important policy, uh, but also environmental policy, state aid, but also organizations like a land register, which can have a, an important blocking factor on the success of our policy. Sectoral, we also would like to focus on, on those sectors which are lagging behind until now in absorption, but not for the sector as such, but clearly if these problems are, are linked to administrative capacity issues. And just to give one example, the railway sector is seen as one of the more problematic sectors all over the European Union, and we see there's a clear reason for this which is linked to administrative capacity. Uh, another scope for our work, and that's also one of the main reasons for me to be here today, is knowledge development to be in contact with uh, other organizations. We're called the Competence Center on Administrative Capacity, but we do not pretend to, to have become an expert in administrative capacity in, in less than half a year. So we're really looking for input uh, and expertise uh, within the Commission from other DGs, but also from organizations outside uh, the European Commission. And if you are mentioned here, and of course, also RSA is seen as one of those important sources. At the end of the day, we would like to set up a, a database of good practice examples. Um, we clearly do not want to keep on uh, pointing out which countries, which regions are lagging behind and telling them over and over what their problems are. They are very much aware of this themselves. But we also would like to come up with solutions and how to see how problems are being addressed in other regions and member states within the European Union. We have two short-term objectives and two longer-term objectives. The two short-term objectives is that we are actually, what we are doing actually right now is stock-taking, so trying to identify what are the key problems in each member state. And secondly, we also uh, are supposed to give guidance to, to the negotiations for the next program period to our country desks, specifically on the topic of administrative capacity, of course. For the longer-term objectives, we are working on, as we call it, toolkits, but it's a kind of a term under which you can understand a lot, but where we would like to offer tailor-made solutions, especially for those member states which are most lagging behind, and where one key word is ownership. So where clearly we are not imposing solutions on member states, but we are offering them, and they should take them over, uh, because if there's no ownership on the side of the member states, it will fail. And uh, another uh, longer-term objective is to look for more systemic solutions, those are solutions which are in principle open for all member states and regions because some of the problems and bottlenecks occur in each member state and each region and then we believe that it's also good to address these more uh, issues in a more horizontal way. 
I would like to go, I have still time? Yeah, good. Uh, I would like to go then through the four objectives and explain you a bit more in detail what we're doing right now. Stock taking, we're actually working now on, on country fishes, specifically focusing on, on administrative capacity, which we are preparing in principle for all the 28 member states, including also Croatia, uh, but with a focus on 15 member states, where we know that most of the problems are concentrated. Uh, so this is more a kind of detailed qualitative description for each country, and the most basic data we summarize in an analytical grid. So the most key factual data are summarized there. And these are mainly related to the financial absorption, obviously, but also uh, findings from our auditors, so related to error rates, risk assessments, etc. And we also use general indexes from outside the Commission. And here we look, for example, at the, the governance indicators from the World Bank, uh, for example, the, the corruption rates, which are prepared by Transparency International. And we group all this information in one document for each member state in order to get a kind of X-ray picture on the status of uh, the administrative capacity in each country. And maybe it's interesting to tell you already some of the first very initial findings because we're still in the middle of the process. Um, but for example, when we look at the complexity of the administrative organizations in member states, and I mentioned it already before, it's not so much that we find the most complex organizations in the, in the let's say, in the new member states. I think when we negotiated the programs, uh, when the new member states joined in 2004, so it's not any more that many, actually I should not say any more those new member states, but the member states were joined in 2004, uh, we see that we managed to, to negotiate relatively streamlined and simplified programs and midst of organizations. Whereas we still see the largest number of operational programs I mentioned before in Italy, Spain, and France, uh, the most complex organizations in Greece and in Italy, and for example, the largest number of intermediate bodies we find back in, in Spain. So especially also in those countries, there's scope for further simplification and streamlining. When we look at the management of the programs, that they are, which sounds obviously, but they should be linked to the existing national and regional administration. But again, we see cases like in the Czech Republic, where in this program period, we have regional programs at NUTS 2 level, whereas there was no administrative organization, existing organization in the Czech Republic at NUTS 2 level. So partly because of the structural funds, a new structure had to be built up, and I think the overall conclusion was that it was not, not so successful. In Romania, they plan to organize regional operational programs for the next program period, whereas the strength of the regions, of the regional administrations, is still rather weak. So for us, it's very important that the management of the programs is linked to existing organizations which have proven to be functional and operational. High staff turnover we still find back in some of the member states, and especially in some of the new member states. And we see in many cases there's a lack of clear human resources strategies. Recruitment procedures are intransparent, and uh, people are not recruited on, on objective uh, selection criteria. Um, strategic plans are being developed, and they are existing, but very often they are being prepared because the Commission is asking for it, but not always they are concretely followed up. From my own experience in, in Poland, I could see, for example, we worked on a master plan for the railway sector, uh, which should be the, the strategic framework for investments in the railway sector, but in the implementation, it was hardly followed up. Uh, totally different projects appeared, finally, for financing than the ones which were identified in the, in the plan. So really, the, the implementation of those strategies is crucial. We still also see that, especially at local level, among the smaller beneficiaries, the project development capacity is weak, and that also excludes very often these smaller beneficiaries from participating in the funds. And that would also be for us an important area to focus on in the next program period. Some sectors are underperforming. Uh, I mentioned already the railway sector, but also some environmental sectors, wastewater treatment, solid waste treatment, and some of the member states are underperforming partly because of reasons linked to administrative capacity. One important bottleneck, the area where we apply almost two-thirds or almost three-fourths of our financial corrections is linked to public procurement. So obviously it's an area where we have to pay more attention to, to raise awareness. Public procurement legislation in most of the member states has now been correctly transposed, so legislation is in most of the cases correct, 
but the implementation is still lagging behind. So there's still a lot of work to be done on awareness raising. And finally, as John already mentioned as well, uh, we still see in many member states insufficient monitoring systems. The monitoring of the financial absorption is in most of the member states perfectly in place, but really to measure the impact on the basis of indicators, target setting, etc., that's an area which is lagging behind. So it's very, not in each country, it's equally possible to measure the effectiveness of our investments. Maybe I go a bit quicker to the, to the next uh, two slides of our... Uh, of our targets. So the second short-term objective is to offer guidance to the country units on the negotiations for the next program period. And here we have three key questions uh, which should be asked by each geographical unit when they meet uh, their counterparts, and they will be subdivided into kind of concrete control questions. First of all, they should check if the setup of the administrative organization is uh, transparent and efficient. So coming back to the previous points I mentioned, number of operational programs, number of intermediate bodies, level of subdelegation, and I will not uh, go into further detail. But secondly, they also should assess to what extent the administration is able to deliver what it proposes. And this is especially relevant for those member states which propose quite substantial changes for the next program period. We see this, for example, in Hungary, uh, where the central coordinating uh, ministry will change. Uh, we see it, in, for example, in France, where the involvement of the regions will become much, much higher. So for us, it's a kind of a signal, especially for those member states which are going to change this system. We have to pay specific attention that the new structure which is being proposed will be able to deliver what they propose. And finally, the third question is the technical assistance budget, which is linked to each operational program. That is not being used as a kind of a lump sum for managing the program, but it is being much more tailor-made and focusing on the most important bottlenecks which have been identified. And for example, we would like to see that the technical assistance is also being used for those ex ante conditionalities where uh, member states have not met the ex ante conditionalities at this moment, but they have to meet them by the end of 2016, so that the technical assistance is being used for, for helping member states to achieve these uh, targets. And secondly, we also try to define some lines to take on very specific technical issues. And they are mainly coming up from the country desk when they ask us for specific guidance. And here the most important one is on the, on the support to salaries. Well, first question, should technical assistance be used to support salaries in member states' administrations? And I think the question for that is yes. Uh, but secondly is also to what extent we, we under what conditions those uh, salaries should be supported. Uh, uh, and here we come back to transparent recruitment procedures, uh, upfront uh, allocation of staff, etc. Then the two short, the longer term objectives I mentioned already is first of all the, the development of toolkits, and this is still I would say the thinking is under development, and we would be very welcoming any suggestions and further ideas. But here we think mainly about exchange of experts, so a kind of a twinning instrument as it was used during pre-accession, but then now mainly focusing on those member states and regions which are most lagging behind. Uh, we look at targeted trainings and workshops, so really focusing on the, the specific needs of each country. And also we look for joint actions with, uh, which are available from international financial organizations. And finally, it's important to think also about the delivery method. We can develop all kinds of nice instruments and tools, but at the end of the day, it needs to be taken over by the member states. So this element of ownership is crucial. And the other uh, more longer-term objective, and also this is more under development, where we would like to address the needs of all member states and regions. When we think about, for example, public procurement, we apply financial corrections, uh, not only in, let's say, in the member states with a weaker administrative capacity, but all over, uh, all over Europe. So there's a need for, for example, for this area to, to look in a much more wider sense in addressing all member states and regions. And also on the systemic solutions, we would like to investigate further which methodologies exist to measure administrative capacity. Um, we have been looking a bit at literature, but certainly more, more can be further explored. We are launching a study on to what extent salaries are being supported right now by, by the structural funds. And uh, in general, we also would like under this heading to cooperate further with external organizations because, just to conclude, we are called Competence Center, but we are certainly do not pretend to have the knowledge at this moment in the House on, on administrative capacity building. So thank you very much for your attention.
the main aim of this session, as always in, in RSA conferences, was to set light on, on where Europe is going with its regional policies. And I would say mission accomplished. Thank you very much, all the three speakers. It was excellent overview where regional policies is going in, in Europe. And now there is time for questions. And we have the fastest mic in Europe. It's ready to cross the whole Europe by bicycle if needed. So who is willing to ask the first question, comment? There is one in behind. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, I am Magdalena Sapawa. I represent the represent <laughs> big word. Uh, I'm from the univer Free University of Brussels. Um, I have a question to Professor Bachler. Um, could you tell us more about your opinion about this strong link linking between the strategy Europe 2020 and the cohesion policy? Do you think in the long term it can have a positive or negative effect on the cohesion? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I mean, that's... That's a very good question. Um, I mean, Europe, Europe 2020 is essentially um, has, has a number of objectives. It's about, um, it's about improving growth. It's about um, improving employability. Um, it's about improving uh, the EU's contribution to uh, addressing the consequences of climate change. Um, so. so it, it has a number of overarching objectives. It was, of course, developed uh, in economic circumstances which are quite different from now. Um, and some of its ambitions, like um, uh, achieving investment uh, in R&D of 3% of GDP, uh, look very, very ambitious, um, certainly in some, uh, in, 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 in some countries. Um, Cohesion policy, or a lot has been promised from the ability of cohesion policy to, um, to achieve these, the, the, these objectives. Um, and the argument is that, well, you have, to, um, you have to ensure that any strategies are localized or regionalized, they're adapted to, 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 to local circumstances. Um, and thus, uh, cohesion policy has the experience, the resources, the capacity um, to, to, to do that. Um, the problem is, is that um, while all the member states have signed up to these uh, over overriding objectives, when it comes to actually implementing, uh, implementing them through, through cohesion policy, it faces immediately a number of constraints. Um, the, those designing programs uh, may not feel that the issues set at European level and translated down through the member states are the issues that are most pressing for them, or that they're not necessarily issues that they can fund because they don't have um, the much funding, or that those, aren't, those, are, those are issues that um, they don't have the capacity to, to, to deal with. Uh, and what, as so often is the case in European negotiations, um, is that you have these overall commitments which are signed up to by prime ministers and, 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 and chancellors and so on. And then um, in, the, in, the, in the negotiations on the detail of the, of the regulations, um, they get progressively diluted and, and weakened. And so what we've seen is a process in the current negotiations is that whereas the Commission starts off by saying, well, we need to spend 80%, you need to spend 80% of your funding um, in the richer regions on small firm competitiveness, on R&D, and on low carbon. Um, member states have been saying, that, well, we don't, we don't really like that. We want to spend more on maybe on, on sort of broadband infrastructure, or we want to spend it on a, more, on a wider range of, 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 uh, uh, of, of targets. Um, so there is a gap, there is an implementation gap, if you like, between, between ob ob objectives and, uh, and reality. Um, the other issue is the degree to which those are, um, 
the, the Europe 2020 targets are, are the most pressing issues right now in, in many parts of Europe. It's simply uh, having sufficient numbers of jobs, um, particularly to deal with youth unemployment, um, which is rocketing in, uh, in, in, in many countries and regions. So there's a question of a balance being struck between these longer term, creating these longer term conditions for, uh, for, for economic growth in the European Union and dealing with the, uh, the consequences of the crisis. So um, that's a long way around of saying, a long way around of saying that it's, 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 it's still very open as to whether a cohesion policy can deliver. Yeah, there is an implementation gap. Somebody might call it as a leadership gap. There is a question from behind. Daya Roschke, University of St. Andrews. I have two comments um, to Michael. Um, you presented single key economic um, indicators to measure a city's success, and I was wondering whether uh, we should think of more integrated uh, indicators to measure city success, for example, to look at um, how economic growth was used um, when there was economic growth used to uh, reduce um, inequality in cities, for example, so to look whether um, there was a correlation between um, GDP growth and um, the sorts of jobs um, that were created in cities or um, housing quality. So I was wondering whether you developed uh, new ideas how to think about cities' success. This is exactly the discussion we now have in the UK about indicators um, to measure success. And my se second comment is on, um, I mean, the, the results you showed um, clearly displayed that uh, the outcomes uh, of uh, economic uh, success was different um, considering different uh, urban systems. So I was wondering uh, whether you looked at uh, differences in um, yeah, more decentralized urban systems and the outcomes in um, highly centralized urban systems and their outcomes. Okay, um, let me confess, as I get older, I hear less. So if I fully understand that question, I've been getting translated here. Um, part of the problem um, when you're doing this work is, is trying to talk about a lot of countries which are in very different positions at the same time. So you end up with, I think, very simple indicators. I mean, you know, we all know GDP is not a very good measure of anything, but we use it because it's the only thing we can use. So. Um, for taking basic measures of competitiveness, we tend to take GDP per capita, total, and employee. When, however, we dug in um, to the experience of particular places, we tried to use much more sophisticated measures. And of course, the obvious point is you can't get very good sophisticated measures which are robust and comparative across a large number of uh, cities. So we're slightly struggling. Um, our study, in a way, was trying to paint a picture of the overall performance and standing of a series of cities and a series of countries. When you get down to the policy implications, I think you need to have a very different set of indicators, much more customized, much more qualitative. And certainly in the case studies, um, you're trying to get measures of some of these issues that John is now talking about, um, crime, health, youth unemployment, we actually have very few robust indicators of social issues across Europe. So I think there is a challenge of how we improve the level of indicators. Um, I think that's all I have to say. There is one more question. We'll take two more questions, from, one from behind and one from here, and then we'll see if there is coffee available. I'm, um, please. Yes, I also have a question on the same issue in relation to Michael Parkinson's presentation. Um, I was interested that in this European study on cities, um, the focus is really on countries and looking at cities within national systems, national ur urban systems. 
And I would have thought at this stage that there is enough analysis at a conceptual and empirical level that we now see cities within global networks and within global systems rather than within national systems. So I would be interested if you can explain this methodological territorialism, if you like, implicit in the research. And for example, at the empirical level, if the globalization in world cities analysis and indicators, um, if that approach could add to the analysis. Okay, I'll do, I'll do a mea culpa on that as a matter of fact. I, I entirely agree. We, tried, we were not asked particularly to look at the global dimension, so we did look within nations and within Europe. So that is a mea culpa. I entirely agree. And there's a lot more to be done on that, but happy to talk about it later. Yeah, my, hello. Yeah. My name is Ulrich Graute. I'm uh, working at the Division for Public Administration at the Secretariat of the United Nations, and I'm a member of the RSA board. Uh, I have a remark and question to, to John and, and, and Pascal. When I used to work here in Europe working for Interreg fund management, I had the impression and I was, always was told that the EU system is so unique and that also the problems we face here in Europe are so unique because there is nothing like the European Union in the world. Then I went to the United Nations in 2008 and tried to forget all of it because I also had the impression that in the UN system, in development management, things are so different. And so I could tell you now for half an hour what are all the differences. But then I heard especially the presentation from John and, and the list of problems you gave. I could give you examples from the UN system with exactly the same list of, of problems. And it's a bit the same with the presentation of John Boymans. And now my, my question is, what do you think? How unique is is the uh, situation you are facing, and are you comparing it with other uh, systems? I uh, took note that um, the EU is, is looking for cooperation with other organizations. That's, that's certainly good. The question, but again, the question is, what do you think? How unique are the management problems you are facing in European cohesion policy and regional policy? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your, for your question. No, I, I don't think that the, the problems we are facing and the management of the, of, the, of the funds are unique and they are only linked to cohesion policy. I think those problems you can also find, could find back in other areas of, uh, of policy. For example, the, the, the policy life cycle I described uh, with, the, uh, with the three three dimensions, I think there's something you can apply almost to any, any sector or policy field uh, with some small modifications. No, and I think also the problems we are facing, uh, there, there are certainly lessons to be learned from, from, from other areas in, in the world or from, uh, from other policy fields, how we can, can deal with them. Public procurement uh, is an important factor having now a negative, well, I wouldn't say negative impact, but a very uh, strong impact on our policy for which we apply financial corrections. But of course, public procurement is a kind of a horizontal policy which has a much wider impact uh, than only cohesion policy. So I'm sure that these, we can also learn from solutions found in other parts of the world and in other policy areas which we can introduce into cohesion policy. Yeah, just briefly, um, the, in some respects, the system is, of course, unique in the sense that you want uh, a common regulatory framework that has to encompass 27, soon 28 member states um, with literally tens of thousands of um, implementing organizations that have to, f in very different institutional contexts. On the other hand, it's not unique in terms of the challenges it faces. Um, it's, the challenges are, uh, are similar to almost any multi-level system of, 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 of governance. And for example, for the introduction of conditionalities, um, we did a study where we looked at international financial institutions and the way that the, the World Bank or some of the, the regional um, development banks um, support um, development, aid, uh, development aid, and uh, uh, but also looked at some member states like, like, like Germany. Um, so 
So many of the issues are, are, are similar to what one, one sees uh, elsewhere. Okay, I think it's time to end this session by advertising one very special session that is taking place half past four today. It's top tips on presenting. It's a skills workshop by the editors of Regional Insights. This was something I promised to do yesterday. So everybody who is interested in top tips, how to make presentations, be welcome. It was a very good session. Thank you. Thank you for the questions, especially thank you for the speakers. And now it's time for coffee that is waiting for you outside this auditorium. Thank you.